Good morning, everybody. Today we will continue with thermal properties of matter. Actually, this will be a brief lecture. I will not go into detail within this lecture. I will only touch to the important points which you need to know within this chapter. We will discuss the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. This is mainly called as ideal gas model. And we will learn how the pressure and temperature of a gas are related to the kinetic energy of its molecules. So we have gas molecules and they have some certain velocity and some certain motion. And what is the relation between pressure and temperature of a gas related to the kinetic energy of its molecules? We will discuss this one and how the heat capacities of a gas reveal whether its molecules are rotating or vibrating. So there is a translational motion, rotational motion, and vibration. We have discussed all these types of motions in the previous chapters, okay? So during this chapter, we will discuss the rotational, translational, and vibrational motion of molecules. We will also learn how the speeds of molecules are distributed in a gas. We will talk about the average speed. We will talk about the RMS speed. So finally, we will discuss what determines whether a substance is a gas, a liquid, or a solid. So what kind of parameters are important in order to determine the phases of materials? Okay, let me continue with the ideal gas model. Here we have an ideal gas equation. What we mean with the ideal gas? Let's consider we have a certain gas and we are keeping this gas in a certain volume, okay? And we consider that these gas molecules do not interact with the environment, okay? So then we have this relation, PV is equal to nRT. You already know of this equation from your high school years. This P here is the pressure, gas pressure. Here we have volume, gas volume. And on the right side, we have number of moles of gas. N, and here we have R, gas constant. And here we have absolute temperature of gas, T. This is the ideal gas equation. And here we have N. What is this N? Number of moles of gas. You can also write this N within this equation. This is the M total, total mass of N moles, which is equal to N times M. Capital M is the molar mass or molecular weight, okay? So this information is sometimes important, okay? In order to calculate this equation, sometimes N is not given, capital M or small m is given. Then if you know this equation, you can solve the problem. Now let me discuss the PV diagrams. This is the ideal gas equation PV and RT. Okay. So, for a certain material, N is constant, R is gas constant, and here we have temperature. Let's consider temperature is also constant. Temperature is fixed, okay? And on the right side, you have a constant number. Okay, just consider this condition. Then, what about the PV on the left side? Of course, it will also be constant. P times V will be constant. So, then, what about the relation between pressure and volume? Let's consider that I increase the pressure. So, what will happen to the volume? Volume will decrease because this part of the equation is constant for an ideal gas. And if I decrease the pressure, then volume should 
increase, okay, in order to keep this part of the equation constant. So here we have pressure in this scale, and here we have volume. And we have behavior of pressure and volume in an ideal gas for constant temperatures and for a constant amount of an ideal gas. So what do you see here? Just choose certain temperature. Temperature is T1. So here we have PV and R T1, okay? And for this temperature, what about this PV? So here we have huge pressure. Then look at the volume. Volume is small. Then I decrease the pressure. If I decrease the pressure, then volume should increase. Okay, what we see here that volume increases. Volume increases, increases. And here at this point, let's consider I have maximum volume, but we have the lowest pressure. OK, because this PV on the left side of the equation is constant. OK, if I increase the temperature, just consider that I have increased the temperature. Now temperature is T2. So what happens if I increase the temperature? If I increase the temperature, PV will increase. So if you increase the temperature, you will increase the term on the right side of the equation, then the term on the left side should increase, then PV will increase. So now I have this curve, this PV curve, because temperature is increased. If you further increase the temperature, we will have this PV curve. If we further increase the temperature, then we have this PV curve, okay? So depending on the temperature, we have different PV curves. If you decrease the temperature, PV decreases. If you increase the temperature, PV increases. So this is the PV diagram. So let me discuss ideal gas equation for the vehicle tires. So here we have ideal gas equation. And here we have a vehicle tire. It contains air. What we have within the air? Within the air, we have nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, okay, hydrogen gas. We have gas molecules, okay? So within this tire, we have some certain pressure. It is about three atmospheres and temperature is much too high for nitrogen or oxygen to liquefy. As tire warms, so look at the equation PV and RT. So let's consider that this vehicle is moving with some certain speed and then this tire gets hot, okay? Then temperature increases. So as tire warms, T increases, the volume changes only slightly because let's consider that volume is fixed with this tire, okay? You can, of course, you can increase the volume a little bit, but you cannot increase it too much. So just consider that volume is fixed more or less. If you fix the volume, then pressure will increase as a function of temperature. So if you check the pressure of the tires at cold days, you will see some certain pressure, okay? PCI or bar. But if you drive the car one hour or half an hour, then if you check the pressure of the tires again, you will see that the pressure is increased. This is due to the increase in the temperature, okay? 
because tire warms. Now let me continue with the more realistic cases. So in the ideal gas equation, we have considered that there is no interaction between the molecules, okay? So here on the left side, in picture A, we have an idealized model of a gas. You see gas molecules, okay? Black points, and they are moving with some certain speed within this volume, okay? And we consider that gas molecules are infinitely small. In addition to that, they exert forces on the walls of the container, but not on each other. So they do not interact with each other in an idealized model of a gas. But in reality, the gas molecules exert attractive forces on each other. So then for the real cases, this equation is much better. So this is called as the Van der Waals equation for a more realistic model. What do you see here? In an idealized gas model, we have PV and RT. On the right side, we have same. On the left side, in an ideal gas, we have P times V. But in a Van der Waals equation, we have P, we have V, but in addition to that, we have these terms, okay? A n square over V square, and here on the right side, we have N times B. This is for ideal gas. We consider that there is no interaction between the gas molecules, and here on the left side, we have equation for a more realistic case, this is called as Van der Waals equation. So let me continue with the PV diagram for a non-ideal gas. This is the PV diagram for a non-ideal gas. So here we have isotherms. What is isotherm? We consider that temperature is constant along the curve. I will go into detail and here we have isotherms for temperatures above and below the critical temperature tc so here we have pressure again and here we have volume okay v and for certain temperature for example, T1, we have this curve, this PV curve. So what is the meaning of this curve? Look at carefully. It is very easy to understand, okay? Just concentrate. This is for non-ideal gas. So here we have discussed the PV curves for ideal gases, okay? So you increase the pressure, volume, decreases, you increase the volume, pressure decreases, okay? According to this equation, PV is equal to nRT if you keep the temperature is fixed, constant. So then we have learned Van der Waals equation for non-ideal gases, okay? Then on the right side, we have PV curve for non-ideal gases. So here at this point, I'm talking about when the temperature is T1 and pressure is here, okay? We have huge pressure and the volume is small. And here we have liquid phase on this left side. And here we have vapor phase. So I decrease the pressure, then volume increases, okay? And here we have huge volume and we have low pressure, okay? You can consider like this. You have same 
mole of gas here within this volume. And here you have certain pressure and certain volume. And now you have increased the volume. Now volume is V2. So you have same amount of the gas within this volume. And then you have pressure two. What about the pressure two? Pressure two will be decreased because you have increased the volume. If the amount of the gas is equal in both cases. So now let's continue. Here we have temperature two. We have increased the temperature. Look at the equation here. We have increased the temperature and the left side of the equation should increase. OK, then look at the PV diagram. Now we have this PV diagram. OK. And we have this PV diagram for non ideal gases. We don't have simple curves. We have complicated curves, so. This is the critical temperature TC here you see. Let me clean this part. You will better see it. Here we have critical temperature. So at the beginning temperature was T1. I increased the temperature T2. TC, T3, T4, it goes. I am increasing the temperature and I am looking for the PV diagrams. OK, so here we have critical temperature. What is this? critical temperature above the critical temperature TC there is no liquid vapor phase transition so look at this one this is the TC okay when the temperature is TC then we have this type of PV curve and uh, below the TC in this range, when the temperature is T1 or T2, what do you see here? That if you manipulate the pressure and volume, here we have material with liquid phase, and on the right side, we have material with the vapor phase. By manipulating the volume and pressure of the gas, you can convert it from liquid to the vapor, okay? But, Above the critical temperature, there is no liquid vapor phase transition. OK, and below the TC, the material condenses to liquid as it is compressed. So you increase the pressure here. OK, in this region, we have huge pressure. Then the material condenses to liquid. OK, so at this constant temperature, you can also change the phase of the material. In the previous lecture, we have discussed different phases of the materials, solid, liquid, and gas, okay? So by temperature, you can change the phase. We have discussed this one during the last lecture, but you can also change the phase by changing the pressure and volume, okay? So this happens here when the temperature is fixed at high pressures, you can change the phase of the material. So now let me continue with the molecules and intermolecular forces. Actually, we have discussed this one in the previous lectures. Just consider that you have a specific chemical compound and it is made up of identical molecules. So here, we have one molecule, okay? One atom here and two atoms are here. So this is a molecule. And on the right side, we have another molecule, okay? And there is a separation between molecules, okay? So you can also consider that for certain temperature, for certain pressure and volume, this is an equilibrium distance between the molecules. So in gases, the molecules move nearly independently. The force between molecules in a gas varies with the distance R between molecules. We have discussed this force, okay? It depends on the R. 
we have also discussed the potential energy. It also depends on the R, the distance between the molecules and atoms. When the molecules are far apart, the intermolecular forces are very small and usually attractive. We have also discussed this one, but here we have a graph. You remember this graph. This is the R intermolecular distance or interatomic distance, okay? This is R0 equilibrium distance. We have discussed also this one. And here in the y-axis, let's say, we have potential energy and force between the molecules. In the previous lectures, we have derived equations for the force and also energy. Just check your previous lectures, okay? And the force has this type of relation as a function of R. This purple curve here, look at this one. What do you see here? At this equilibrium distance, force is zero. Okay, force is zero. Remember the mass attached to the spring. Let's consider this is the equilibrium. X is zero, okay? And this is X is equal to A. And let's consider this is maximum stretched position and here we have force, restoring force and force at this condition is maximum. But what about the force here? Force here is zero because force is given minus kx. If x is zero, then force is zero. Okay, just like this. We have already discussed this one, but I just reminding you. So here we have R0 and here force is zero, okay? And what is this R0? I have two molecules. And R0 is the distance between them, okay? So they are happy to stay within this distance. But if you decrease the distance, then let's consider this is the Neve distance between the molecules. This is R. What do you see here? Force increases. It is like compression in spring, okay? Just consider that you compress the spring. What about the force? Force will move this mass to the equilibrium condition. So here, the force will move these molecules to this equilibrium distance, okay? Here we have repulsive force, okay, in this region. Here in this region we have repulsive force. And just consider that we are increasing the R. Now I am looking this region. If I increase the distance between the molecules, Then this is the R, okay? I have bigger distance between the molecules. Then the restoring force will be attractive, okay? Like here, like in the spring, if the mass is staying here, then the restoring force FR will be attractive. It will push the mass to the equilibrium, okay? So this is, same behavior. What about the potential energy in between? We have also discussed this one in the previous lectures. I will not go into detail. Around the equilibrium distance, we have minimum energy, okay? And they are happy to stay this distance. Here we have an important statement. Molecules in solids are essentially fixed in place, while those in liquids and gases have much more freedom to move. What I mean with this one, here you see atoms in a solid. This is 
creates the structure of sodium chloride, ordinary salt. What do you see here? This, let's say, yellow atoms are the sodium ions. Okay, here we have sodium ions, and the green ones are the chloride ions. Okay, these big ones. And they have certain fixed position. Look at this sentence statement. Molecules in solids are essentially fixed in place. Okay, this is a solid, crystal structure of sodium chloride, and these atoms, ions, are fixed, okay, fixed in the crystal. But in case of liquids or gases, they have much more freedom to move, okay? So if you have gas atoms here, gas molecules here, they can move with some certain freedom. But in solid here, they have fixed positions. But of course, they can vibrate. We will discuss this one. Here you see again a picture of a solid crystal. This is the scanning tunneling microscope image of the surface of a silicon crystal. This one. OK, so what do you see here? These are the atoms. You can see that. These are the silicon atoms. They are perfectly arranged within the crystal, okay? They have certain positions and certain shape. They have periodic arrangement, okay? In three dimension. And what about the area here? The distance here is nine nanometer or nine times 10 to minus 9 meter. So this is again 9 nanometer. Okay. What is the meaning of 9 nanometer? 9 nanometer means 90 angstrom. Okay. And the size of one atom, the diameter of one atom is around 5 angstrom, 2 angstrom, 2.5 angstrom, something like this. Okay. So if you have 90 angstrom, if you divide by 2.5 or 2, you should have more or less 40 atoms here, 40 atoms here, 40 atoms here, okay? So if you count the atoms here, you should find more or less this number if you know the diameter of the atom. Of course, also the crystal structure is important. So we have many atoms here and this is a solid, okay? This is a solid phase and the position of the atoms fixed. And let me continue with the Avogadro's number. Here we have important information. You already know from the chemistry, but I will repeat it one mole of a substance contains as many elementary entities, atoms or molecules, as there are atoms in 0 0.012 kilogram of carbon-12. So then, this statement, one mole of a substance contains Avogadro's number of molecules. So what do you see here? Within one mole, we have this number of molecules, okay? 6.022 times 10 to 23 molecules in one mole of a substance. And what about the molar mass? Molar mass of a substance is given with this expression. Mass of a molecule of a substance, okay? This is M, mass of a molecule of substance. And this is the Avogadro's number. We have this number of molecules. And then this is the molar mass of a substance. 
And in the previous transparency, we have also seen this one and total n times m. What was the n? Mole, okay? Here we have considered that this mass, molar mass, mass of, molar mass of one mole, okay? But if you have n mole, then the total mass will be like this, n times m. So I will not go into detail with this part. You already remember from your chemistry lectures from the high school years, and you also remember from your university chemistry lectures. Now let me continue with kinetic molecular model of an ideal gas. You know the word kinetic. What is the meaning of kinetic? If you have this word, it means that there is a movement, okay? Then we will talk about the movement of the molecules in a gas, okay? So here we have four statements. A container contains a very large number of identical molecules. Just consider here we have a container with a certain volume. And here we have molecules, let's say. The molecules behave like point particles that are small compared to the size of the container and the average distance between the molecules. So second statement, second sentence tells us that we have container and we have molecules, but molecules are very small, okay? Very small molecules. This is the volume of the container and compared to the container, these molecules are very small. In addition to that, we have distance between the molecules. Look at the distance between the molecules. The distance between the molecules is huge compared to the size of the molecules. This was the second statement. Third one, the molecules are in constant motion and undergo perfectly elastic collisions. So they have certain motion, they are moving and they have collisions, okay? So these are the motion of the molecules within this container and they have elastic collisions. Remember the elastic collusion, they don't lose their kinetic energies, okay? So, this is given in the statement. And the last one, the container walls are perfectly rigid and don't move, then volume does not change, okay? So, this is the kinetic molecular model of an ideal gas. We are talking about perfect ideal conditions. So, what about the collusions and gas pressure in this container? During collusions, the molecules exert forces on the walls of the container. This is the origin of the pressure that the gas exerts, okay? Origin of the pressure. We have volume here and we have gas within the volume and due to the collusions, we have pressure within this container, okay? Here we have on the right side a graph. Just consider this is the container with volume V, okay? And just consider this is Y axis, X axis, and here we have a molecule. Molecule before the collusion, okay? And it is moving like this with some certain speed v. And you can write the components of this velocity along the x-axis v1x and along the y-axis v1y. Just give this name vy and here we have v1x. Just give this name minus vx. Just consider that it is moving along the negative x direction. And then here we have a collusion 
between molecule and wall of the container, and then due to the elastic collusion, it goes with the same speed V, okay? Speed does not change because it is elastic collusion. And what about the other components of the velocity? This is the X component of the velocity. So it is given with V2X. This was the V1X at the beginning before the collusion, after the collusion V2X, and it is equal in magnitude to this one, but it is given with positive sign. In the previous case, we have here negative sign. What about the VY? VY is same, both in magnitude and also in direction, okay? So here we have important statements, velocity component parallel to the wall does not change. This one, this velocity, okay, which is parallel to the wall, it does not change. Velocity component perpendicular to the wall reverses direction, but magnitude does not change and speed does not change. Okay, this is the collusion. And what about the gas pressure? Here we have a wall. Again, just consider that this is the wall of the container and we have gas molecules within this container. Just consider that this is a cubic container and we have gas within this container. Just consider like this. And we have molecule with some certain velocity Vx here. Okay. And just also consider that the all molecules within this container have same x velocity Vx. Now, if a molecule is going to collide with a given wall area A during a small time interval dt, it must be within a distance Vx times dt from the wall and it must be headed toward the wall. So just consider this particle here, this one. It has certain Vx and it will collide with the wall area, okay, here in dt time. And what about the distance? X distance is given with Vx times dt, right? Now we have this one here for this particle. So the number of molecules that collide with area A during dt is equal to the number of molecules within the cylinder that have their x velocity aimed toward the wall. So we have many molecules within the container and just consider that this is the cylinder and we have number of molecules within this cylinder and here we have area A and here we have length this one Vx times dt then you can calculate the cylinder volume area times L okay Vx times dt this is the volume of the cylinder then the total random kinetic energy of translational motion of all molecules in a gas. Look at this one. The motion in this direction or the motion in this direction or the motion in this direction. This is translational motion. OK, we have learned this one. There is also rotational motion. OK. Particle molecules can rotate around itself or they have this some um, circular orbit or they they can have this type of translational motion or they can have a vibrational motion. OK. 
But here we just consider translational motion and rotational and vibrational motions are ignored. OK, we are just talking about the translational motion. So then the total random kinetic energy of translational motion. Why they have kinetic energy? Because they have velocity. OK, they are moving. So then translational motion of all the molecules in a gas is directly proportional to the absolute temperature. This is very important. Look at the equation. In a container, we have gas molecules, OK? And this volume has certain V and certain temperature. And then these particles, these molecules have certain kinetic energy and we have certain pressure within this volume. And then the average translational kinetic energy of an ideal gas is given with 3 half nRT, gas constant R, absolute temperature of gas, what is the temperature within the volume, and then number of moles of gas. This is the average translational kinetic energy. Then I can also write this kinetic energy with this one, one half m v square. Here we have v. What is this v? This is the average. What is this average? Average value of square of molecular speeds. OK, we have many molecules within this volume. They are moving with some certain velocity and I'm talking about the average velocity. OK, then. The average translational kinetic energy per molecule. Depends only on the temperature, so look at the right side here. This is the average translational kinetic energy of a gas molecule, and it depends only on the temperature. Here we have K, Boltzmann constant. Here we have 3 half. They are also constant, so here we have absolute temperature. So if you increase the temperature, then you can increase the average translational kinetic energy. If you decrease the temperature, then you can decrease the average translational kinetic energy of gas molecule within this container. Let me continue with the molecular speeds. In the first lectures of this course, we have learned the root mean square. You remember this term RMS, OK, root mean square. So the root mean square speed of the molecules in a gas is given with VRMS and it is given with square root of. Average value of the square of molecular speeds, then it is given with square root of 3 KT over M, or you can also write square root of 3 RT over M. So now let me continue with the collusions between molecules. So in the ideal gas model, we have considered that the gas atoms are point particles and they have very small size and there is a huge distance between the molecules. OK, so we consider that they do not interact each other. OK. But in real cases, molecules can interact each other and they have collusions with the neighboring molecules. So just model the molecules as rigid spheres of radius R. Here we have one molecule. Let's consider it has spherical shape with some certain radius. Here we have another molecule with the same radius. We have same molecule with the same radius, same molecule with the same radius, same molecule with the same radius. 
And what about the mean free pass? Just consider that we have many molecules and they do not interact each other, but they are moving, okay? They are randomly moving within the container and they will collide at the end, okay? After a certain time, they will collide. But what about the pass without collusion? This is called as mean free pass. The mean free pass of a molecule is the average distance it travels between the collusions. So just consider that here we have a molecule. It is moving with this speed to the right side and we have another molecule with the same speed. It is moving in opposite direction, okay? They have some certain distance, let's say X distance, okay? And after certain time, DT time, they will collide, okay? So during this DT time, they will move without any collusion, and after certain time, they will collide. And this one, x half here, is the mean free pass for this one. x half is the mean free pass for this one. So here, just consider we have many molecules, okay? And they are moving with the same speed in different directions, okay? So now they do not collide but after a certain time they will collide, okay? So the average time between the collusions is the mean free time, okay? During this mean free time there is no collusion, okay? So they travel freely and this distance, this average distance, they travel between the collusions is called as the mean free pass. They can travel freely within this pass. I hope it is clear. If you have any question here, please let me know. Okay, let me continue with the collusion between the molecules. I would like to calculate the mean free pass of a gas molecule. It is given with lambda, okay? It defines the average distance traveled between collusions, okay? This is equal to the speed of molecule times mean free time between the collusions, T mean, and you can also write this equation like this. I will not go into detail. This is the volume of the gas. And here we have radius of molecule, and here we have number of molecules in a gas. Just consider that here we have a container with volume V and we have gas molecules within this container, okay? And each molecule has certain R radius, okay? Radius of molecules. And we have N number of molecules in gas, okay? Then what about the mean free pass? The average distance between the collusions. So what do you see here within this equation? If you increase the N, it means that you have more molecules. Then what will happen? This mean free pass will decrease, right? And here another important term R, radius of the molecules, just consider bigger molecules. Okay, now we have bigger molecules with bigger radius. Okay. What about the mean free pass? So if you increase the radius, then the mean free pass again will be decreased. Okay. And just consider that here we have one, two, three, four, five, six molecules. And now I have 
container with 2V volume is increased and I have six molecules. So we have six molecules here with big R values and here we have same molecules, same number of molecules with the same radius, but the volume of the container is increased. Then the mean free pass will increase because there is large distance between the molecules and they can travel without collusion for a long time, okay? So you can consider like this, this defines this interactions in the gas. Okay, let me show you heat capacities of gases. In the previous lecture, in temperature and heat chapter, we have learned heat capacities, okay? And here we will discuss molar heat capacity at constant volume, ideal gas of point particles. So here we have molar heat capacity for an ideal monatomic gas. Monatomic means we have just single atom, helium, for example, neon, argon, okay? So we have, we have monatomic gas here, and then molar heat capacity is given with 3 half R, R is the gas constant, and for an ideal diatomic gas, just consider nitrogen, or oxygen, okay? Here we have two atoms within the gas molecule, okay? Here we have single atom. So then the molar heat capacity at constant volume for an ideal diatomic gas is given with five half R, are again gas constant. What do you see here that this is bigger than this one, right? Then you will see that. Here we have some molar heat capacities of gases here on the right side. This is the CV molar heat capacity in joule per mole per Kelvin. And for monatomic gases here, helium, argon, we have just single atom, okay? And it is given with this one, three half R. And for diatomic gases, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon monoxide, we have these numbers, okay? This is five half R, it is increased. And for polyatomic gases, there are different numbers here. We have carbon dioxide and other gas molecules. Here we have learned the molar heat capacities of ideal monatomic gas and ideal diatomic gas. Here we have molar heat capacity, which is given with three half R. And here we have molar heat capacity for an ideal diatomic gas, which is given with five half R. So, and I have also given the certain numbers of calculated values of molar heat capacities. These are the calculated molar heat capacities for monatomic and diatomic gases and also polyatomic gases, okay? And here we have experimental values for hydrogen gas. Look at the hydrogen here. Let me choose the pan. Here we have hydrogen. It is the atomic gas and it has molar heat capacity, which is given with this number, 20.42 joule per mole per Kelvin. Okay, and what about the experiment? And what happens to the molar heat capacity as a function of temperature? On the left side here, on y-axis, we have CV, molar heat capacity, and on the x-axis, we have temperature. This is the zero Kelvin absolute temperature, and then we increase the temperature, okay? Then we will see what will happen to the molar heat capacity of the hydrogen gas. So this is the 50 Kelvin, and this is the 
600 Kelvin. OK, so below the 50 Kelvin, hydrogen gas molecules undergo translation, but do not rotate or vibrate. So this is the 50 Kelvin. If you have hydrogen gas molecules below the 50 Kelvin, so we are talking about the low temperatures. And in this part, hydrogen gas molecules undergo translation, but they do not rotate or vibrate. OK, and above this temperature, if you increase the temperature above 50 Kelvin, appreciable rotation motion begins to occur. So here we have translation plus rotation in this region. OK, here we have in this region, we have just translation. OK, and after 50 Kelvin here, we have rotation. So what is the meaning of that? Here we have a container. It has certain volume and within the container we have hydrogen molecules. OK, and if the temperature is lower than 50 Kelvin, they only have translational motion. And if the temperature is higher than 50 Kelvin, in addition to the translational motion, this hydrogen molecules have rotational motion. OK. And above the 600 Kelvin, if you further increase the temperature, then appreciable vibrational motion begins to occur. So then here we have vibration. So what do you see here that molar heat capacity increases as a function of temperature? This is the experimental value for hydrogen gas. And these are the theoretical values for different gases and also for hydrogen gas. And here we have the equations for monatomic gas and diatomic gas. So now let me continue with the molar heat capacity of a solid. Here we have talked about the gas atoms, gas molecules, helium, argon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, okay? We have gas atoms and gas molecules. And what about the solids? So in solids, what I have told you that if you have a perfect crystal, then it means that we have periodically arranged atoms in the crystal, OK? They have certain fixed positions in the crystal. So then what about the molar heat capacities? This is the molar heat capacity of an ideal monatomic solid. What about the monatomic? just silicium atoms, just iron atoms, just nickel atoms. OK, we are talking about monatomic solid and it is given with three R. OK. So each atom has an average kinetic energy at certain temperature and the kinetic energy is given with three half KT and average potential energy, which is also given with three half KT and average total energy per atom is given with 3 kT. So if you see kT, just remember the energy, OK? So kT tells us something about energy. This is the kinetic energy. This is the potential energy for each atom within this monatomic solid. You can consider like this. And here we have experimental values for lead, for aluminum, for silicon, and for diamond, okay? This is the DeLong Pettit prediction. DeLong Pettit prediction is this one. CV is equal to 3R. This is the DeLong Pettit prediction for the solids. And what about the experiment? Experiment tells us this one. This is the temperature scale x axis. This is the molecular heat capacity scale y axis. And 
we are increasing the temperature. So just look at for the diamond. You increase the temperature, okay? We pass the 1000 Kelvin and it goes to the 3R, okay? And here we have lead, for example. You increase the temperature and even at lower temperatures compared to the diamond, it reaches to the 3R, okay? To the DeLong Pettit prediction. So at low temperatures, CV, molar heat capacity, is much less than 3R. This is the theoretical prediction, the long patted prediction. And at high temperatures, CV for each solid approaches about 3R in agreement with the rule of the long patted. So now let's talk about the molecular speeds as a function of temperature. This is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, gives the distribution of molecular speeds. This is the distribution as a function of speed. This is the speed. And here we have three different temperatures. Let's consider that T1 is the lowest temperature, and this is the distribution of molecular speeds. What is the meaning of that? Here, let's say velocity is zero, and here velocity is V1, okay? And here we have different molecules with different velocities, okay? VA, VB, VC. So we have a container and we have molecules within this container. It has certain volume and temperature. So each gas molecule has certain speed, okay? So, of course, they don't have the same speed. There are different speeds here, but the distribution is like this. This is the black curve it is given. Okay, some molecules have this speed, some molecules have this speed, some molecules have this speed, some molecules have this speed. If you increase the temperature, now let's consider that temperature is T2. We have increased the temperature. So then what will happen? Of course, you increase the energy, you give energy to the system, then distribution will be like this. Okay, now this is the maximum velocity gas molecules can have, and here we have different velocities. And if you further increase the temperature, you will increase the maximum speed, okay, and distribution will be like this. As temperature increases, the curve flattens, the maximum shifts to higher speeds, okay? So this is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution as a function of temperature. So what about the most probable speed? The most probable speed, VMP for a given temperature. For a given temperature, the most probable speed is at the peak of the curve, okay? We have a container, it has certain volume, and we have certain temperature, C3, and we have gas molecules, okay? So they are moving with some certain speeds, okay? Within this container and the most probable speed is this one, okay? So we also have molecules with this speed, we also have molecules with this speed, and we also have molecules with this speed, but this is the most probable speed. And this distribution, what about the shape of this distribution? This is the shape of the distribution. Distribution versus velocity. Here again, distribution versus velocity. So how to draw this distribution? This is given with Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. This is the FV. And look at this one. Here we have V, velocity of the gas molecules. Here we have V. Here we have temperature. Here we have temperature. Okay? So if you increase the temperature, then distribution flattens. 
at the beginning it is like this. If you increase the temperature, it becomes like this. OK. So this is the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. So let me discuss the phases of matters and then I will finish this lecture. As I told you at the beginning of my lecture, for an ideal gas, we ignore the interactions between the molecules, but those interactions are what makes matter condense into the liquid and solid phases under some conditions. So in an ideal gas, we have a volume and container. We have container with volume V and we have gas molecules and we consider that they do not have interactions. But what about liquid? Just consider here we have liquid and we have molecules within the liquid and just consider solid a crystal. OK, so what do you see here that within the solid? And also within the liquid. There are interactions between the molecules, between the atoms. OK, you cannot ignore them. So. And we know that each phase is stable only in certain ranges of temperature and pressure. OK, so we have discussed that if you change the temperature, for example, just consider that here we have liquid. If you decrease the temperature, then it will be ice. It will be solid. If you increase the temperature, then it will be gas. It will be steam. It will be vapor, right? And in the first part of this lecture, we have also discussed that if you increase the pressure under certain temperature conditions, you can also change phase from gas to liquid. OK, this is also possible. We have discussed all these things and a transition from one phase to another ordinarily requires phase equilibrium between two phases and for a given pressure, this occurs at only one specific temperature. So just remember the phase diagram for the water. This is the time and this is the temperature. Let's say in degrees Celsius and this is the zero and let's say this is minus 10 degrees Celsius. Here we have 100 degrees Celsius. OK, and. So you heat the eyes, OK, you transfer heat to the eyes and then here we have phase change. It goes from solid to the liquid and then you increase the temperature of the liquid. And here we have another phase change from liquid to the gas. And now here at the last position, you increase the temperature of the gas you increase the temperature of the steam of the water okay so this is stated here and we can represent these conditions on a graph with axis p and t called phase diagram so look at this one here we have produced phase change as a function of temperature so from liquid to the gas or from gas to the liquid or from liquid to the solid. We have changed the phase with temperature. OK, I have used temperature, but. You can also produce phase change by changing the pressure. OK, just consider that you keep the temperature constant and you change the pressure, then you can produce phase change by changing the pressure. I hope this part is clear. So by manipulating the pressure, you can produce phase change in the material. Don't forget for a certain temperature. Okay, now here I will show you PT phase diagram. Here in the y-axis, we have pressure and here in the x axis we have temperature okay in this range 
material all solid here. What we have here, we have low pressure here, low temperature. Here we have, let's say, high pressure, low temperature, much higher pressure, low temperature. Here we have higher temperature and also high pressure, okay? So you can read this type of diagrams like this. And here for a certain material, material all solid. And here material all vapor. And here material all liquid, okay, in this range. Here we have a critical point. I will talk about this. And here we have a triple point. I will talk about this. So what you see here, look at this range. I will change the color of the pen. Then I will continue. Here we have a border, you see. At this border, solid to vapor phase change occurs. So this is called as sublimation curve. So here in this range, material is all solid. And here material all vapor, okay? And here we have a certain curve. Then material can go from solid to the vapor directly. OK, without liquid phase or material can go from. Vapor to the solid. OK, this is special condition and it occurs at special temperatures and special pressures. So just consider this point. If the pressure is this value, if the temperature is this value, then you can change phase from solid to the vapor directly, and this is called as sublimation. You already know of this one, sublimation. You can change the phase from solid to the vapor directly, okay? And here we have another curve. Look at this one. This is the fusion curve. On the left side, material all solid on the right side material all liquid and by changing the temperature or by manipulating the pressure you can convert the phase of the material you can change the phase of the material from solid to the liquid okay and here we have vaporization curve as you can see you can change the phase of the material from liquid to the vapor, okay, or from vapor to the liquid. And it happens by manipulating the temperature or by manipulating the pressure, okay? And here we have triple point. Look at this one. We have triple point. What is this triple point? At the triple point, solid, liquid, and vapor can coexist, okay? All three phases of material can coexist. This happens at certain temperature and certain pressure, okay? If you adjust the temperature to the triple point temperature, and if you have the proper pressure for the triple point, then all phases, solid, liquid, and vapor can coexist. And here we have critical point. Look at this one in this phase diagram, this last information. So at T and P values above the critical point, the material properties change smoothly with changing P or T rather than undergoing a phase change. So the temperature is here at TC and the pressure is here PC, critical pressure, and above this point here in this region, okay, in this region, material properties change smoothly with changing pressure or temperature rather than undergoing a phase change. So let me give you one example related to the triple point. Here we have discussed the triple point, this one. What is the triple point? At the triple point, solid, liquid, and vapor can coexist. So look at this iceberg. 
this is the iceberg, okay? So it is made from water and it is solid. And here within the sea or ocean, we have again water, now it is liquid. And in the air, we have water vapor. It is also water. So at certain temperature, at certain pressure conditions, gas, solid and liquid phases of water can coexist. OK, so atmospheric pressure on Earth is higher than the triple point pressure of water. So we have certain pressure condition depending on the temperature. If you also have special temperature condition, then water can exist as a vapor, as a liquid or as a solid. OK, this triple point. Gives us this information. OK, now let me continue with the PVT curves. So here we have pressure. Here we have temperature. Here we have pressure. Here we have volume. And we combine this PT and PV curves in a PVT curves. OK. So pressure is this one. Pressure is increasing in this direction. Volume is this one. Volume is increasing in this direction. And temperature is this one. Temperature is increasing in this direction. Here you see a PT curve, pressure versus temperature. Let me choose another color. This is the temperature. Starts from zero Kelvin. This is the pressure. And at low temperatures, we have solid phase. OK, just consider water. And at certain temperature and certain pressure, we have transition from solid to the liquid. And at certain temperature and pressure, we have transition from liquid to the vapor. And here we have a triple point. And this region, we have sublimation. Phase transition from solid to vapor, from vapor to the solid. And here we have a critical point we have already discussed in the previous transparency. OK, this is the PT curve. And here on the right side, here we have PV curve. This is the volume. This is the pressure. So just consider at certain temperature and certain pressure, the material is solid. OK, here in this region, material is solid. And here we have solid liquid transition. And here material is liquid. And here we have solid vapor behavior. Here we have liquid vapor behavior. And here material is gas with some certain pressure and volume. And here we have critical point. OK, so what happens to this PV graph as a function of temperature? Remember the PV graph in previous transparencies. Let me show you. You see this PV graph? This was the PV graph for different temperatures. OK, here we have liquid phase. Here we have vapor phase. OK, this was the PV graph for non-ideal gases. OK, so as a function of temperature, PV curve changes. As a function of temperature, PV curve changes. Look at this transparency now. So here on the right side, we have this PV curve. And we know that PV curve changes as a function of temperature. So if I increase temperature here you see different temperature values i can manipulate this pv curve okay and if you keep the volume constant so we have this 
PT curve. And if you manipulate the volume, you can change this PT curve. So here we have PVT diagram, this one, which collects all pressure, volume, and temperature parameters in a phase diagram. Here we have solid, here we have solid vapor, here we have vapor, here we have gas, here we have critical point, here we have liquid vapor, here we have triple line, okay? This is the PVT curve for material and very important for material science. So under which temperature, under which pressure conditions, material has solid form or liquid form or gas form. These are very important informations for technological applications and also for scientific research. So here I have discussed PVT curve for a real system, okay? This is the real condition. What about the idealized system? Just consider ideal gas. And what about the PVT curve of ideal gas? So here we have a surface. You see, this surface is called as PVT surface. And this is for a real case. What about the PVT surface for an ideal gas? Remember the ideal gas equation, PV and RT, okay? Just consider that volume is constant and I increase the temperature. If I increase the temperature on the left figure, what you will see, pressure will increase. This is constant, this is constant, okay? and volume is constant. If I increase the temperature, pressure will increase and we will have this type of behavior. We increase the temperature and then pressure increases, okay? If I increase the volume and then keep the volume constant, then increase the temperature and increase the pressure. So you see, depending on the volume, but during this temperature change, volume is constant, okay? Now, here we have P, V1, and RT. And here we have P, V2, and RT. And here we have P, V3, and RT. So for certain constant volume, I change the temperature and then I manipulate the pressure. This figure on the left side demonstrates this one. And look at the figure on the right side here. We have pressure and volume. Again, look at the formula for the ideal gas, PV and RT. Just consider that temperature is fixed. PV and R. T1, temperature is fixed, then I increase the pressure, then volume will decrease. So we have this relation, okay? Just change the temperature, and RT2, just increase the temperature, increase the pressure, volume will decrease, or decrease the pressure, volume will increase, okay? We have this relation. Okay, you have already learned this one. Now, just combine this PV diagram and PT diagram in a PVT diagram. Here we have pressure, here we have volume, here we have temperature, and we have PVT diagram here, and here you see a PVT surface. What do you see here? This black one, shows us constant pressure. Here, pressure is constant, okay? And here, pressure is constant for certain pressure. 
And this is, let's say, orange color shows us constant volume. Another name is isocores. So look at this one. This graph. Volume is constant and here we have PT curve. Here, the last one, constant temperature, green curves here. Temperature is constant and pressure versus volume changes like this, PV curve. Now let me clean and you can better see it. Just look at this PT curve. Volume is constant and PV and RT. Okay, volume is constant. For certain volume, we have this type of behavior. Look at this one, volume is constant and we have this type of behavior as a function of pressure and temperature. And this was this one, constant volume, isocores. And here we have PV curves for constant temperatures, this green ones. Look at this one, pressure versus volume. Pressure here, volume is here. And for constant temperature, for constant temperature, we have this type of behavior. For another temperature, we have this type of behavior. For another temperature, we have this type of behavior. What do you see here? We have this graph here as a function of temperature. And here, now let me talk about PVT surface. This surface here in the PVT diagram let me choose the pen. Look at this surface. This surface is very simple. Okay, compared to this one, look at this surface. This surface is very complicated compared to the idle gas. You see, this PVT surface is complicated. And here in idle gas, condition, we have much simple PVT surface. So with this one, I have finished my lecture. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye.